Alexander of Macedon by Harold Lamb continues with part. Continues part one with chapter five, The Road to Troy. Or is it true? Because if it's Upsilon, it's true. There were many who, in, in after years, pointed signs and portents that appeared throughout the Greek lands during the months from the sinking of the Pleiades to the rising of the star Arcturus that spring, when it was not certain whether Alexander of Macedon would lead his army to Asia. In the marketplace of Pella, fishermen related how the seeress of Delphi had refused to prophesy whether the Asiatic venture would succeed or not, when Alexander had insisted that she speak, she only said cryptically, Eh, you, Alexander, you will always have your way. The fishermen wondered if this were a true prophecy or not, and whether Alexander were truly their king, the son of Philip, or the son of the godfather, born out of the witchwoman, Olympias, had he not in three days reduced mighty thimps to fly infested blood and charcoal and broken marble, a fate more catastrophic than the hero Achilles had administered, aided by the gods, to true itself in their highlands, the hard-headed Macedonian farmers Likewise, begin to wonder about the soft-spoken man with the beauty and strength of a Heracles, who had held his head on one side and listened to them, his blue eyes eager and friendly, when he told them how to doctor the ills of their horses and how to brew fruit juice and balsam for their own beverage. With the build of an athletic, with the build of an athlete able to break. A Cerise's wooden shaft between his hands, he avoided the physical struggle of pugilists or wrestlers shrinking back from a battle's engagement. He had plunged three times into the heat of a battle at Calrana, at Pelion, and Thebes, like a drunkard rushing to a feast. These peasants and horse breeding nobles of Macedon had understood Philip. They did not understand his studious absent-minded son who wrestled with dilemmas in his tent by lamplight pouring over manuscripts as if performing the ritual of a strange shrine before plunging into monstrous action while the common people wondered the generals of the army told alexander he must lead the macedonians into asia and they told him why his father had decided on the venture the staff had worked out the logistics of the campaign that would take one half of the manpower of Macedon, about 25,000 men across the Dar Danellus. Parmenio himself had gone ahead to prepare the brigade to be thrown across that strait at Troy. Antipater would remain at Pella to safeguard the homeland with overage soldiers. When he trained recruits and kept Olympias quiet to sap the resistant strength, of the unstable Greeks, they would take along with them contingents of the more venturesome Athenian hoplites and cavalry from Thessala. It had been all worked out. It would succeed. It could not be abandoned now. Why not, Alexander said? General Clanophon could not stay on in Asia with his 10,000. I should know more of these Greek names, and, but some of the Greek pronunciation is going to sound difficult because we don't quite say those things that way in English. Um, so therefore, I'm not quite used to it either. Could not stay on in Asia with his 10,000. His book is not called Journey In. It is the Anabasis, the Journey Out. Parmenio knew that Alexander had read the book. But Parnetmenio was getting on in years, and his three sons rising to high command in the army. 
He wanted to retire after this, the last victorious campaign, and leave the direction of the armed forces to his sons. If the army were disbanded, what would happen to them? The risks had been calculated. He explained patiently, We can assume that our field army will defeat any force sent against it. Even if that is so, we have no hold on the sea. The Persian fleets are in the waters, but Permenio pointed out the route would be along the land, except in the narrow Dardanelles, Dardanelles, and he had provided against failure there by running a slight risk so they could win immense gains. They could liberate the rich Ionian coast opposite Greece with its historic sea points Miletus and Ephesus, where the seven sleepers slept. Halicarnassus, where Mausolus lay in his tomb. Sardis, where affluent Croesus had reigned. They could control the grain route to Euxine.